Okay, today we're looking at the subject through a glass darkly, which is based on a, a line that comes from Paul. And I'll quote that in a moment, but the subtitle is, What We See is Not What We Are. What we see is not what we are. And that's the uh, idea that we want to talk about today, and it's based on this scripture. <clears throat> For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And this is uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, King James Version. And I rarely quote from King James, although there's something about it that uh, it has a, an authoritative feel to it. The language is beautiful, but they say there are thousands of errors, translational errors in it, and it's written in a kind of a Victorian language, which we don't really speak anymore. But uh, when I use a quote, I will look, when I use a scripture, I'll look at different versions to see which one I like best, to see which one seems to say what I want to say. And so that's the advantage of having so many translations. I think there's, I think I read there was like 600, over 600 translations out there. And they're still being done. You know, they're still being translated. It's, uh, the, the study of Scripture is extremely interesting, the origins of Scripture. They have thousands and thousands of ancient manuscripts that range everywhere from whole books to pieces of uh, the manuscript that might be the size of a credit card or even smaller. Uh, some just barely survive. And they date these things in different ways. One way is uh, textually. They can tell if a Greek, certain Greek word was used, it uh, is used in a certain time period. And so a textual scholar, a critical scholar, can tell when that is to a very uh, relatively close uh, accuracy. They can carbon date <coughs> scriptures, uh, I mean uh, samples, but of course when you carbon date something you have to destroy part of it to get, to get, it, uh, to get the date from it. So they don't want to do that with these manuscripts. But we have thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces that scholars go back to and, you know, people specialize in certain aspects of these ancient texts, but they try then to come out with the most accurate rendering of whatever it is that they're, uh, that they're looking at. And that's a discipline most of us will never get into. So we have to depend on what, what is discovered. And what's interesting about this is there is much disagreement on just about any subject that you look at. And so if you look at it, uh, what does meditation mean, for example? Uh, you could ask three scholars, three, three, uh, three theologians, um, three atheists. You know, you could come up with different definitions for what that one word means. And we have that in the English language, you know, it, we have words that have multiple meanings. Like I could say, do you see the cat walking across the yard? Or I could share an idea and say, do you see what I mean? It's a completely different approach. And so a scholar that part of their job is to figure out what a word means. They say some Greek words can have 21 meanings. 20 some meanings per word, but you understand it within the context. But if you also understand how things were published in uh, ancient times, like we have four gospels, and there was a time when that would have literally been true. There were only four of these documents existing. Because how was, it, how was a gospel published? It was handwritten and there would be one. 
And so the original was one. We have nothing anywhere close to that. And they say that a, uh, the manuscript would last maybe 10 years under good conditions with handling and all that, and so it would have to be copied. And I'm sure they would start copying before the 10 years was up. And as they copied, they'd say, well, I don't quite understand this line, so I'm going to change it to where I, this is what I think it means. And so we have that, and the scholars are able to detect these differences. But when you take that idea and you remove it by probably hundreds and hundreds of copies, where we don't have anything near the original, you know, we're hundreds and hundreds of copies away from the original. So by the time we get to the first copy that we have, it's been changed who knows how many times. So that is a problem. And when uh, you have things like uh, in Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, or Paul's letter of Timothy, he makes the statement that all Scripture comes from God. What we don't stop and think is, what does he mean by Scripture? Whoever was writing that, and scholars don't think it was Paul, but Paul's given the credit for it. Whoever was writing at that time, there was only an Old Testament. There was only Jewish Scripture. So when we say all Scripture is of God, apparently we're not talking about the New Testament. So we've got to think about these things. I mean, that's one of the benefits of scholarship. It is, it answers a lot of questions and it also confuses us, keeps us on edge. So that's why I feel very comfortable with where I have come to. I listen to scholars all the time. There's uh, one I'm listening to now that he's got a series, uh, uh, Bart, Earnhardt, I think it is, Earnhardt. Um, he travels all over the world. He's world-renowned. But he is full of just very helpful information about the background of the church. He gave a, I heard one lecture on the difference in Christ and the Messiah, the, wor the two words, and there is no difference. The Messiah is the, a Jewish term meaning anointed or a term given to the king. Uh, Christ is the anointed one. It's the same word in Greek. One's Hebrew, one's Greek. And so we, it helps to understand these things. When they came to Jesus and tried to make him king, you got to think in terms of Hebrew. He would have been thinking in terms of Jew. What is a Jewish Messiah? The Jewish Messiah was a person who was going to show up and put the Jews back in control. They would appoint a king, and that would be the anointed one, the Christ. But it's nothing like we tend to think. And was the Messiah to be, was he to suffer and die for the sins of the world and then be resurrected? There's nothing in the Old Testament about that. It's a constructed idea by the early church. And what the early church fathers did is they went back into the Old Testament and they found scriptures that seemed to support the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had to suffer, die for the sins of the world, and would return. But the scriptures they use are taken so out of context that there's no way, if you understand the history behind them, that they would be referring to Jesus. So what I'm saying here is we're going to ask some questions today, and there are no easy answers. But we take information that we have, and we take what makes sense to us, and we take, take it based on our experience. Um, as I have said, I now approach Jesus. I see him as a Jewish mystic. And so when I read a saying of his, I say, is this something a mystic would say? Or is this something the early church would say? And with the information that I have from both scholarship and from the uh, mystical tradition, a lot of information out there from my own experience, I look at it from that 
point of view, and that becomes my authority. Because a scholar will look at the same, the same thing if they've never had a mystical experience, never been really introduced to that literature, they will answer the, you know, the question in a different way. They don't ask, does this sound like something a mystic would say? Does this sound like something the Jesus of history, as I understand that culture and that religion and the environment he grew up in, does it sound like something he would say? Or does it sound like something the early church would say? So we've got several voices going on here. And the one that I look for is the voice of the mystic. And that's what I have come to. It's not necessarily something you'll come to, or it's, uh, certainly as most academics would not come to it because it's subjective. And they want facts, you know, they want the scientific process, which is good. And I really appreciate that. And it has a lot to offer. So we have this statement from Paul, and the reason it came to me is because of the questions that were raised. This passage came to mind when one of our regular viewers raised a series of questions that I know are on the minds of many in our audience. How much are we bound by thought living in the human body? Answer, a whole bunch. <laughs> Do we actually admit do we actually omit any decision-making from our soul? Yes. It's easy. Are we here for, human, for a human experience viewing the world from the body's perspective? Yes. So that's the answer to all three of those questions. But it's not good enough just to say these things. We have to know why we say them and why what rationale would be behind that because they're all very good questions and they raise some good questions they raise the problem of being here on this planet in this body with all the things that come before us so the spiritual quest can feel like a hobby compared to the day job we have of living life in a physical body much of what we read and hear sounds good, but its practical value often crumbles in the face of, quote, real life, unquote, issues. Paul seems to think the day is coming when it will all make perfect sense. And I think that's true as well. But do you notice how you do that? You'll read a book, you'll uh, have a discussion with somebody that's very stimulating very enlightening and then you'll go out and like i got a letter from the irs this week <laughs> which um, all of my spiritual stuff temporarily goes out the window even just looking at the envelope it's kind of the uh, it's the white coat syndrome of taxes of money <laughs> it's like you just look at it and your blood pressure goes up well, I've done that before, and I opened up, reluctantly opened up after our meditation, opened it up, and it might be a check. You know, it's like all that for nothing. But in this case, it was simply a question that our, my tax preparer, which I used to be my tax preparer, but I have hired somebody, but they entered wrong information. And so we figured out what that was, and, you know, I send them a letter and um, a fax, and we get that result. But you've got to deal with that kind of stuff. So here you are saying, I'm a child of the infinite. My soul is limitless. And you get a letter from the IRS. <laughs> and suddenly your soul doesn't really matter because your soul doesn't owe any taxes. <laughs> you know, it doesn't owe anything. And you can prove this. If you check out, you don't owe anybody anything. <laughs> you know? Maybe somebody else does. But your soul never has to respond to the IRS. But your other part does, <laughs> that human side. And so it's just uh, interesting how that eclipses, and it can eclipse in just a moment, just with a moment's notice. And so it's like a, and I told you about the credit card issue I had a couple weeks ago. I had a $150 charge on the credit card and it looked like a fraudulent charge. The bank said, you've got three charges here. 
one of them looks fraudulent, the other two look okay. Well, the one they said was fraudulent wasn't. It was a charge of an annual subscription to Microsoft Office. <laughs> so I don't know why they thought that was fraudulent, but the one I thought was fraudulent was the $150 one at a gas station where I didn't get $150 of gas. What I found out was the gas station will make that charge on your card, then they take it off just to make sure that the cost is covered. And I didn't know that. So when that was explained, I was everything was fine. So, I mean, we have a lot of things like that. And how much time does it take to figure that out or, you know, find out to con contact the right people to figure it out? I had to call the bank and go over with them. Actually, the fraud department, last time I did that with the church account, that, that was a six-month nightmare. And we finally got it straightened out. But um, so... Th that's earth life. That's the part of earth life that I, I would just soon not have to deal with. But I have discovered having a body, that seems to be part of the agreement, that there's a lot of things attached to being on this planet, being in this body, where the soul can chatter away all at once, and you shut it off. You know, you don't hear it. And you think, well, I should be able to do that. I should be able to keep that consciousness. You know, that's the kind of the ideal. One of these days, I'm going to get there, get to the point where I get that letter from the IRS, and I'm just as happy as I ever was. No changes in my attitude whatsoever. No fear, no doubt. No wondering if uh, I'm going to survive to see tomorrow. That's what you think. <clears throat> and maybe that's possible. There are people that walk around with this smile on their face, a pristine looking smile, and I wonder maybe they've made it. Maybe they're in that mindset. I just have not gotten there. There's times I do get there. There's times I do better than, I, than other times. But then I find things, I have uh, an Achilles heel, I guess. There's weak points that if something is touched, the, the spiritual thing is set aside. And the personality comes out and f tries to, you know, starts fixing the problem. But the soul doesn't know how to write letters. It doesn't know how to fax. It doesn't know how to do a lot of things that we have to do, we're required to do. So we drop down into that state of mind and we're there a great deal of our day. We're gr there a great deal of the time. We may be thinking, again, the hobby while we're doing the day job, you know, the, the living in the body, that's the day job. And one of these days, I'm going to quit this day job and do my hobby full time. You know, <laughs> that's kind of how we think. I really question whether that's even possible in a physical body. Um, if you know somebody that can demonstrate that that's true, bring them, introduce me to them, <laughs> and I want to have a chat with them. <laughs> the biggest complaint people have is that their return, let's see, did I miss something here? Uh, talking about, oh, the reason I like near-death research is because it gives us a view through the window into that realm where when these people step out of the body, all the stuff I just talked about doesn't exist. Someone who's out of their body could care less if there's, they, you know, hovering around the room, they look down, they see a letter from the IRS on the bar, they could care less when they're looking from that point of view. It's only when they return to the body that they, the letter means something again. But the biggest complaint people have is that their return to their body strips them of the indescribable beauty and freedom of unbridled consciousness. I think what I did is deleted another slide I had in the middle there, which is okay. But <clears throat> experiencing total freedom out of the body, then they're, they're brought back into the body. If I, uh, when I make that transition, when it is my time, because they're told it's not your time, you got to go back. When it's my time, I'm going to try to get on that board because they're told it's not your time, you've got to go back, but they're never told why. And when I get on that board, I'm going to say, let's, let's tell them why. Let's tell them why they're going to go back, what they need to do, so they can not spend the next seven years totally baffled by this experience. 
let's tell them. I mean, is that asking too much? Is it just like uh, all these infinite light beings of light, you know, with infinite intelligence? They say it's not your time, okay. Why? Doesn't matter. It's just not your time. <laughs> Go back. And next thing they know, they're back in the body. And they're not happy about it, usually. And they still don't know why they had to go back. So we're all trying to make sense out of this, this thing in the body. I believe that we made a choice to be here. And I think I have evolved to the place where that must be a good thing. I don't always know what that is. I don't know that it's always a good thing. It doesn't feel like a good thing a lot of times. The older I get, the more reasons I find for not thinking that's a good thing <laughs> because the body starts shutting down. You know, it uh, does things that it doesn't normally, didn't do when you're 30 years old. And you start noticing things about the body that you have to deal with. And it's just a, there's a transition. There's a, there's a part of body ownership that is kind of a pain. Pain itself is a body thing. You know, we don't have pain. The soul doesn't hurt. You can't pinch the arm of a soul. So that is what upsets people when they come back from this limitless place to this very limited place. The universe they see in that freeing experience disappears. It dumbs down. And suddenly we don't have that perception that we once had. When I had my own mystical experience many years ago, and I've had several uh, lesser ones in the meantime, and every time I touch that, I think I'll never leave it. It feels like I, should, I would never want to leave this. And when it was uh, uh, so intan intense when I was in my early 20s is when that happened. It was like, there's no way I'm ever going to leave this. But then a couple of days go by and the world creeps back in. You know, it just becomes, and I was reading uh, about the, uh, the mystical experience. Uh, they say it lasts about 15 minutes on average. Uh, if, if it's a very intense one, it might last half an hour. It's like the, but, but the transition into that reality never goes away. It's the near-death experience. It's like that may last just a couple of minutes, but they never forget it. It changes them permanently. When you have this deeper experience, you're not the same, but you come back to this earth and you try to figure out, what do I do with this now? What do I do with this body? It doesn't move around like my unencumbered soul. It gets hungry. It gets cold. It gets hot. It has to get in a car to get somewhere. There's all kinds of limitations, and there was a time I didn't have that. I didn't feel, I didn't, my experience was not that in depth, didn't go that far. But it was so incredible, the amount of love that I experienced, that's what draws me to the near-death experiences. They all talk about this love, and I know what they're talking about. It is, it permeates everything. It's not love like you're loving somebody. It's a, it's a living reality. It's a, it's a field. It's the, the creative life force. It's uh, not anything like something you give to somebody. It is what you are. But <clears throat> you can't just touch that at will. And you certainly can't send it to somebody at will. You can say, I'm sending out love. You know, we say that very easily, but it's nothing like this. You don't have to send this out. It's already there. It's there fully all the time, and we're not aware of it because we have these physical blinders on. So one woman said she did not want to come back, but resigned to the notion that there must be something more she needed to learn from her human experience, though she didn't have a clue as to what that was. And that's kind of... You hear that a lot. People kind of resign to being back here. Uh, some of them feel very betrayed. You know, why was I cast out of that experience? Was I not good enough? And the 
answer seems to be, well, you, there's something you came here to learn and you haven't learned it yet. Okay, tell me what it is. You know, write it down. Give me some clue as to what they did. Well, it's never done. They have to figure it out. And maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe that there is a reason for that. I don't know what that would be. It's like <clears throat> if you're put up to your neck in a pit of mud and told you must learn to be happy, you know, what's the lesson? What would that give? What, what would the purpose of that be? And in a sense, being in a body is being trapped in that kind of thing. We are nothing on the soul level. There's nothing on the soul level that comes anywhere close to resembling what we are in the personality on the body level. It's, it's like night and day, just beyond explanation. So how do we learn to love? Many say we are here to learn to love, but then they say the love they experience on the other side is far greater than anything we experience here. How can we learn to love in such a way? And I would say we can't learn. You don't learn to love. When a person leaves their body and enters this condition of love, those who experience this absolute love do not learn how to do it. Once the curtain is phys of physicality lifts, they realize that a self-existent reality engulfs them entirely, independent of thinking, beliefs, learning, any effort to evoke love. And that's what I don't understand about those who say that. They go, they make this uh, passage to the other side, experience this incredible love, and then come back saying, well, I guess that we're here to learn to love. <clears throat> They say that in one breath, next breath, this is something we, had, we don't have here. A level of love we don't experience on the human level. I've heard several mothers say that have made the transition and come back. Uh, we talk about motherly love, how the highest form of love on earth is the love of a mother for her child. She said, you would have to multiply that by 10 million to come even close to the kind of love that I experienced. And what's even more interesting is a mother like that, <clears throat> that loves her child, will not want to come back to raise that child. They would prefer to go on, but often they're stopped, said, you need to go back. Here's what this child's life would look like if you weren't there. And so they'll see it from that perspective and make the choice to go back. But many of the people that have that experience come back feeling very guilty because they were willing to leave their family, leave their loved ones for this incredible experience. So what that tells you is there is a lot higher level of experience available to us than most of us are experiencing through the body. So we often ask, what's the point? Why would we come into something like this? And I have to believe that we had a reason and we saw what the reason was. We know what the reason is at a deeper level. And so part of our work is to say, why would I make that choice? Why am I here? Instead of just doing our day job, making a living, you know, uh, to maybe spend a little more time on the hobby. On why am I physically here in this moment right now? Because I could check out any time. I could figure out a way to do it. Could be like uh, the guy that drove off cold shivers, the cliff, <laughs> the monument. The one guy didn't make it. He landed on a ledge beneath, so he had to pay the bill for that. So you want to make sure you're driving off the right place if you're going to do that. But people who, who commit suicide and come back say the same thing. It doesn't work. If it's not your time, you're going to be sent back and you can blow half your face off with a 12-gauge shotgun and you're going to go back to it and you're going to heal it. You're going to figure out how to live life 
from that perspective. You think it was hard before. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. But <clears throat> so why would we make a choice like that? Where we jump into something that we probably know it's going to be difficult when we do it. And I think one of the reasons we would make a choice like that is because we are making that choice from that free, absolute free state of mind. This won't be so bad. Even if I do a little suffering, it's only going to be 90 years. That's nothing, you know, compared to eternity. And that's what they say, too. The time that we spend on Earth is like a blink of, eye, a blink of the eye. Don't you get that? How did I get to be 70? <laughs> I blinked my eyes and I was 70. It's like, how does that happen? But the soul doesn't know that. The soul doesn't go through that. So any experience it has, or that we have in a body, you know, we're, we're so dumbed down in terms of our spiritual awareness that we don't have that bigger picture. And the ones that do step out for that few moments, they say it takes about seven years for them to put things back in perspective, to incorporate that experience into their daily life, because it's so absolutely different from what they experience in those just a few moments. So that's kind of what we're, I'm not answering any questions today. I already answered them in the beginning. Uh, we're all here to think about these things, to think about why I may have chosen this experience. And I personally believe that we all did. And sometimes I feel like I'm getting close to the answer. And most of the time, I don't think I know. Why? Did I come here to be a minister? To save all your souls? Well, I come to the place where I think your souls are already saved, so I, that's not really much job security, you know. <laughs> if you're already saved, not much use for me. But <clears throat> I'm here to maybe remind you of these kind of things. Is that my whole purpose? To come for you? I think uh, what brought me into this field was my interest in these ideas. It's like, I wasn't thinking about saving the world. I don't think I could do that. I don't think I need to do that. I was interested in pursuing these ideas. And I thought, what better way to do that than get into a career like this? And it's been very good. Why do we incarnate? The consensus seems to be that we had our reason. See, I'm not answering the question. <laughs> I'm putting it on your shoulders because it's this is your thing, not mine. Don't complain to me. Some a woman one time was very angry at something a ex husband had done, and she had asked me, "Why would God let him do that?" <laughs> like I <laughs> was supposed to be able to answer that question. Um, if you perceive God in that way, then you've got to figure it out because <laughs> I don't think that way. It's not a matter of God allowing us. Anyway, the consensus seems to be that we had a, a reason, but we've forgotten. I fully believe that the spiritual teachings that appeal to us do so because we recognize something in them we already know at the deepest level. I was drawn to unity for some a reason that was not up in my head. It was like a soul response. The ideas that I read I loved. I was drawn to the near-death research for the same reason. There's something that just, I resonate with that. And that to me is, the, that those are the things that we should pursue, the things we resonate with. Because I can throw the material that I, that has meant something to me in front of somebody else and it'll mean nothing at all to them. They're not resonating with that. They'll have a whole different thing. But I was asked, you know, how do I, judge right from wrong. How do I know what, what is good information and what is not? And I come back again to my own personal experience. I know that what I experienced was real. It was the most real thing I've ever experienced. And when I hear somebody talking about something like that, I understand that they, they have been to the same place in some way that I have. It's like if you have never been to Missouri and you try to convince me you have and you start talking about it, I could tell pretty quickly that whether or not you've been there. 
just by what you say. It doesn't take too long because I grew up there and I know a lot of the dynamics. But um, if you've been to a place, you'll recognize the person, another person who has. That's why I think Jesus was a mystic. He had an experience that is beyond this whole physical body thing, beyond the whole religious construction that he was born in. He was talking about tapping into this deeper level of reality that abides within all of us. But it's like there's a door there. I can tell you there's a door that there, there, there's something big knocking at that door. But it's your door. All I can do is say, you have this door and there is knocking and you know that knocking. Our job is to keep asking, seeking, and knocking and the door will open. Then we shall know even as we are known. So this was not a talk full of wisdom and answers. It's really more of a provocation. It's... Uh, I don't know why I'm here physically. I truly don't. I would like to. I'd like to be able to stand here and say, yes, I do remember now why I chose to come in this body. I know what interests me, and I think that what interests me has something to do with that choice. But as far as choice, if his watch is still working. <laughs> so I'm going to quit here. <clears throat> but that's, that's why I say follow the things that interest you, because that is probably tied directly into the choice you made to come here. If you're not here by choice, then somebody else tossed you into this fray. And I don't like that idea at all. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.